time to get to Arsenal now. And they are on the verge of completing a signing of defender Ricardo Calafiori from Bologna in a deal worth around £42 million. For more on this, we can speak to Italian football expert Mina Rizzucchi. Mina, lovely to see you. Thank you so much for coming on. Let's start with Calafiori. Tell us a little bit about what Arsenal are getting. Oh, one of the finest uh, Italian youngsters in defence. He proved himself to be such a great package and a player with an incredible winning mentality. He's really achieved so much success in this last year at Bologna and for the, national, uh, for the Italian national team. I think that all of us will mostly remember him for what he managed to do against Croatia. He has been, he was so important to Italy in the back line, playing as that centre-back but also in just as an ability to be a playmaker, even from a defensive point of view. He knows how to break lines, he's tall, he is uh, exceptionally physical, but at the same time, brilliant with his feet, technical, tactically intelligent, versatile, and, uh, and a player who, is, uh, who always wants to play until the final second, always progressive and with a great winning mentality. Honestly, <laughs> Italy is uh, sad to see him go, but he is an excellent, excellent player. Uh, uh, well, you said winning mentality there. Tell us a bit yeah. about why he chose Arsenal. What was the driving force? Because we understand there were other clubs interested, even the likes of Real Madrid. Maybe that came in a little bit too late, that interest. Well, with Real Madrid, I think their eyes were always on Lenny Oro. So I, I think that was more to do with what his agents and others were trying to really leak to the media at the time. So I'm not sure about that interest, to be honest with you. But Juventus had clearly set their sights on him. Uh, they obviously brought in Thiago Motta, who was his coach at Bologna, who had managed to bring out the very best in him. Remember, he arrived from Basel for four million. He was a youth product at Roma at the time and let go. He had gone to Genoa for a little bit, then moved to Basel. And at Basel, they learned that really, honestly, his best position is at centre-back. Bringing him back for four million and then him managing to do all of that. So there was always question marks about whether he should be going to Juventus to play with the coach that really took the best out of him and made him this player that everyone put set their sights on and, and allowed him to play for the national team. But in the end, it was Arteta's playing style. It was the money offered to Bologna and it was their decision to, to sell abroad. And from those choices, Arsenal was the best fit for him. Uh, Mia, good to see you as always. Uh, one thing that's really stood out about Calafiori is his flexibility in terms of like positions he can play. He can play at left back, he's played at left wing back before. He's also played as part of a back three. Arsenal obviously have had an inconsistent situation at left back. Is that where you see him slotting in or where else could he fit in? Ideally, it would be a real shame to not see him play as a centre-back because I think that is absolutely his best role and that is what his old coach at Basel Vogel also said. He is exceptionally good in the left don't, don't get me wrong he's he's technical he can he's fast perhaps not as fast as, as other left backs would be and he's got a great cross on him but at center back he can he is really he has that position locked down and i think it's the best role for him because of his tactical intelligence because of his technique because of his ability to break the lines but like you said he can play in all roles including defensive midfield so should Arteta choose to play with a three-man at uh, the back or four men at the back, he can play anywhere on the left side. He can even play in defensive midfield because of his understanding of the game in general. But I think, you know, being a left-footed player, you would ideally want to use him now, considering that there's, there's a great partnership at the back for Arsenal uh, in centre-back. So left-back is perhaps where he would be uh, best suited and he will definitely make the most of that role and really show you what he can do, especially with his crossing and his technique. But obviously for us, we would like to see him develop more in that centre-back role. Mina, do you think he can start straight away in the Premier League or do you think he'll need time to adjust? This is a difficult question to answer, really. It depends on the amount of discipline or let's say that the ability to understand what his role is by Arteta. If, he, if the tactics suit him, if he can be thrown into the deep end, I think absolutely. Because his mentality is one in which he's a very hard worker and he's the complete package. He really believes in himself. And I think that's the difference. You saw, for example, with the Italian national team, there wasn't much belief in their abilities. He was the standout performer in that sense. He reckons himself quite a bit. And I think that confidence allows him to really hit the ground running. He made such a, a difference at Bologna, especially against the big teams. So I, I definitely know that he's not scared of any challenge uh, and it will really depend on the tactics because of where they would like to position him. But certainly I think that he can start the first match. I don't think he's going to find it too daunting. Mina, um, a deal that's already been done 
this summer is Joshua Zerksi to, to Manchester United. It's a big signing for them, obviously. Uh, he's going to compete for that starting spot up top with Rasmus Hoyland. Can you tell us a bit more about Zerksi as a player? Zerksi is, is an interesting player because he's a nod to sort of your old school, technically, intel uh, technically uh, perfect striker. Perhaps not a modern forward in the way that you would describe Rasmus Hoyland. He's a player for Bologna, where a lot of times he would drop deep and collect the ball. I think the best way to describe him nowadays would be a nine and a half, because what he is is a playmaker. He can very much do a lot of what Bruno Fernandes can do for Manchester United. He is a creative player. Um, he is perfect in his layoffs, perfect in playing within a team. He reads game situations really very well. He was a Bayern Munich youth star, so and he was very technically intelligent despite his big size. So he's very big up front, but doesn't perhaps always stay in the box. And there's, a, there's been some criticism of the fact that he didn't score more than 11 goals and he wasn't starting for the Dutch national team. I think that has more to say about Ronald Koeman and his decisions than it is about Joshua Zerbsi, because honestly, he's quite a phenomenon at Bologna. He was very highly regarded for his intelligence, highly regarded for his technique and his adaptability. And he's a maverick of sorts. There's very little that he can't do, but it's Manchester United and he needs to be developed per perfectly and allowed to play the role that suits him. So it's about how can he integrate with Bruno Fernandes? He likes to play in a, in a front two, so Hoyland and him could work well together, but, this, but he needs to suit the tactics and, and Ten Hag has a big job on his hands. Yeah, uh, sounds like reasons to be excited for Manchester United fans, then, Mina. Um, sticking with the sort of United theme, uh, David De Gea, it looked like he was going to Genoa, but that is now off. I mean, what's happened there? Well, this is very strange as well, because obviously he's taken a year out, and then all of a sudden there was all this news of Genoa who were looking for a goalkeeper uh, going for David De Gea, which is perfect because Genoa has such a, a great the way that they've managed their last season has been brilliant to watch. They've got a, a brilliant coach in, in Gilardino, so they they were always doing better than I think anyone expected them to do as a newly promoted team. And this was going to be a splash for them on the market. But unfortunately, David De Gea does come with a big name, despite the fact that he hasn't played for the last year. And uh, according to sources, he's just asked for a little bit too much money, way more than they, they are prepared to pay or even have to pay. So I'm, I'm not sure if that deal is going to happen anymore, but otherwise it would have been a really perfect deal. And I think he would have really enjoyed his time there. But obviously salaries make a difference. Yeah. Um, Mina, lovely chatting to you. Always brilliant Thank to have you on the show. Thank you so much for your insight and we'll chat to you soon. Thank you. Um, just, just sticking or kind of going back to Arsenal, starting off with Ricardo Calafiori, Kwaku, uh, hearing from Mina, I mean, it sounds like, sounds like a brilliant signing for Arsenal. Absolutely incredible signing for Arsenal and it's a coup because he was linked with so many big clubs like you mentioned before, Real Madrid were interested in his services. He's a player just going to bolster this Arsenal first level and this Arsenal squad as well. Um, he brings so much in terms of defensive qualities but he's also very good going forward and comfortable with the ball at his feet. And it speaks to what Arteta's done at Arsenal since coming in as manager. 18 of his 24 signings have been either goalkeepers, defenders or central defensive midfielders. And so he's trying to build that firm base at Arsenal because he knows that obviously attackers win games, but defenders win championships. And that's what Arsenal are trying to do right now. They're in the mode of trying to win titles. And I think Califuri helps them do that. Yeah. Uh, Nabej, you were having a bit of a deep dive earlier on Good Morning Transfers looking at, we were saying how versatile he is, looking at where he could possibly play for Arsenal. Interesting Mina saying, no, like we kind of want to see him at centre-back. <laughs> yeah, I mean... I think Mina being a, an Italy fan, yeah. that does make a lot of sense. Um, but I, I also think back to the great AC Bilanti where Maldini played at left-back, who's an outstanding centre-back, but they had to ship him out there because they had Nesta and Stam at different times and they had mm -hmm. other pairings. I think Calafiori might have to do that because you have Gabriel and Saliba who have this connection. Uh, but as I mentioned in the deep dive, when you come up against teams that are going to sit in, and more teams will sit in now against Arsenal, they will give them the respect. That's where it's actually fine to have a centre-back in there who can drive in possession alongside Saliba. You want two centre-backs that can play out, really, so you can play out of both sides. That's where I might see him in that centre-back, but I do see long-term. I don't see how Gabriel loses his position. Sam was saying off-air, last season he was unbelievably good. Probably better than Saliba at times. Can't now drop him and bring in Calafiori because I don't think that's the 0.2% Arsenal need to increase on. It's that left back. Mm. No, it's also, gonna, gonna be interesting, isn't it? Also, team harmony. You know, you don't really want to throw off the, the best the best defense in the league last season. You know, they wasn't conceding goals, they were all fully fit. I think it makes sense if they're thinking long term in terms of 
they had a quality season, but no one really got injured in that defence, except from left back, where they had to, you know, kind of freestyle with Tomiyasu, uh, Zinchenko, Kiwi or there as well. But I think if he does come into the starting lineup, it will be it will be interesting to see whether he starts at centre back, whether they push him to left back, where Yuri and Timber fits in all of this. Uh, that's what I'm more interested in seeing. Yeah, um, obviously got Calafiori up here. We've got Eddie and Kessier as well, and Emil Smith Rowe. Um, there are expected to be a number of outgoings. I suppose you could throw Reese Nelson into that mix. We could maybe throw Aaron Ramsdale in there. Yeah, Eddie and Kessier, are man on screen there. He's a player that has served Arsenal well over the last couple of seasons. Obviously got the new contract a couple of years ago, got the number 14 shirt as well. And when Gabriel Jesus went down with an injury a couple of seasons ago, he came in and he was an adequate backup. Mm. But at this point in his career, he needs to be playing first team football. Mm. And so a move, whether it's abroad, whether it's in the Premier League, is definitely best for his career. And Emerson Smith is also a player that has struggled to get into the Arsenal starting eleven since suffering an injury a couple of seasons ago. And so a move for those academy prospects looks like the best option for the club and those players. Yeah. Now, exciting news if you support Manchester United. The owner, Sir Jim Ratcliffe, is in favour of building a new 100,000 capacity stadium rather than redeveloping the original and existing stadium of Old Trafford. The new proposal could cost £2 billion and would result in the largest stadium in the UK. Let's get some more on this. Our senior reporter, Melissa Reddy, is out in LA with Manchester United on their pre-season tour and joins us now. Melissa, very good evening. Um, what more can you tell us about this news? Yeah, Mike, nice to hear from you. Manchester United are not just thinking big, they are thinking gigantic. The Old Trafford Regeneration Task Force, they've initially concluded that a new stadium would be a much more transformative option than just redeveloping Old Trafford. And so they've mooted, as you've said there, a 100,000-seater stadium. Now, this is very much in keeping with Sir Jim Radcliffe's great vision of Manchester United having one of the best sporting stadiums of all time. He wants somewhere that is a world-class destination rather than just a ground where fans want to submerse themselves in the surroundings. Now, four task force meetings have taken place to discuss the feasibility of the project, which would be built on the expansive club-owned land adjacent to Old Trafford. And the idea there is they really want to turn the community into a thriving hub of leisure and business opportunities with improved transfer links as well. United have done a lot of recon. They have spent time visiting and researching some of the best stadium redevelopments across all sports, particularly ones that have had a focus on transforming the community. And chief amongst them is actually the SoFi Stadium here in LA. And having been in it, having experienced it, it is larger than life. It is just out of this world. Obviously the property of Arsenal owner Stan Kroenke and the way they have totally uplifted the Inglewood area has really been a source of education for United. They've also gone to Real Madrid and studied the Bernabeu redevelopment. They really like the Chicago Bears Burnham Park project. So United really taking a holistic view on this. Now a new build, very, very, very expensive, upwards of £2 billion. And so finances are a key aspect that the task force is looking into. And a whole stack of private funding opportunities will be assessed. But the club still believe there is scope for private and public funding, just given how much it would impact and uplift the community. Now, a full task force recommendation is expected towards the end of this year but so far if it goes according to plan how United wanted to go how Sir Jim Radcliffe definitely 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 wants it to go it's sounding very much like a Hollywood fairy tale which is apt given we're in LA when the news breaks yeah, I'll tell you, if they get anything like the SoFi Stadium, they'll have something, won't they? So all good on that front for United, it looks like. Not injury front, though. What's the very latest on these two significant injuries in pre-season? 
Yeah, it's funny that you say that because everything else around Manchester United has been so positive. The stadium news, the latest amongst that, but just the security around Eric Ten Hag's future, uh, the feeling around Ruud van Nistelrooy being back and how much that's enlivened the players and how they've enjoyed his sessions. You know, they've got transfers in over the line early. They're selling well, finally. Lots of positivity around the place and then bam, double setback and we've asked about Rasmus Hoyland and Lenny Euro what's the prognosis there the club had to wait a minimum of 24 hours for the swelling to go down and the area around the injury to settle now that was only last night that's a minimum of 24 hours sometimes you can wait a little bit longer so you can get a more accurate gauge from a scan but we suspect we will get an update on both of them either later today or latest tomorrow. Now, with Hoyland, he suggested to the medical team that it was just a hamstring injury. And he looked in good spirits when he walked through the mix zone. He's been active on social media. So the feeling around him is that it might just be a slight hamstring tweak, hopefully. But there was definitely more concern around Euro, so it'll be intriguing to see what the actual outcome is but yeah probably later today latest tomorrow for a diagnosis from united okay we know you'll bring it to us when you know our senior reporter melissa reddy out in los angeles for us thank you melissa ricardo calafiri joins arsenal for 42 million pounds already training in the u.s ricardo calafiri has wasted no time integrating into his new team the Arsenal Gunners, as they prepare for their final preseason tour match against Liverpool in Philadelphia. The Italian international, who completed his £42 million transfer, joined his new teammates at Subaru Park. The arrival of Calafiri, officially confirmed on Monday afternoon, saw him sign a five-year contract with an initial fee of around £33.7 million. Having flown to America, Calafiri has already participated in an individual training session and is expected to be involved in some capacity when Arsenal faces Liverpool at Lincoln Field Stadium on Wednesday night. His versatility as both a central defender and left-back makes him a significant addition to the squad, joining the likes of Gabriel, Ben White, William Saliba, Jakub Kiwier, Oleksandr Zinchenko, Takahiro Tomiyasu, and Jurian Timber as defensive options for Mikel Arteta this season. Calafiri began his professional career at Roma, making his Serie A debut in August 2020 in a 3-1 victory over Juventus. Despite his potential, he struggled for regular playing time at IG Alarasi and was loaned to Genoa for the second half of the 2021-22 season before joining Basel permanently in August 2022. His impressive performance in the Swiss Super League led to a return to Italy with Bologna for £3.4 million, where he thrived under Thiago Mata, emerging as one of Serie A's standout defenders and helping Bologna secure a Champions League spot. Calafiri carried his stellar form into Euro 2024 with Italy, catching the eye of Arsenal. The Gunners, boasting the best defensive record in the Premier League last season with 18 clean sheets and only 29 goals conceded in 38 matches, look to further fortify their backline with Calafiri as they aim to surpass Manchester City for the title. If I get this far, fan, show your support and subscribe to our channel so you don't miss the latest news, and if you don't forget to leave a like, thank you.